Hey everyone, welcome to today's conversation, which is about expanding with distributors. I know our panelists here are all very well versed in this topic, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so we're gonna hear from, we have two CPG founders, Renee Dunn, who is the CEO of Amazi Foods, Jem DeSico, who is the CEO of Super Coffee, Keto Life, Keto Life um, and Trent Moffitt, who is the CEO of, of Gotham Brands, which is a distributor and incubator for new brands, along with merchandising support and a little bit more. So I also want to make sure to call out our sponsors today, Tracks, formerly survey.com, which helps brands um, merchandise and really sell their products off the shelf. If you are looking for help getting your product um, moving once you're launching into new retailers or really putting together a good strategy on how do you grow within a retailer and get consumers to actually buy your product, feel free to shoot me a note. I'm happy to introduce you to the Tracks team. So with that, I'd love to jump right into the conversation and we'll start with Renee. I'd love for you just to give a sense of about how many stores you're currently selling in and what your distributor uh, profile looks like in terms of what size distributors you're working with and you know regional or national. Sure. Um, so thanks so much for stuff for inviting me. I always have a little bit of a like, why did you use me when I goes on panels? But it's great to be here. Um, but we're in around a thousand stores. Um, we work um, with Kehi a good bit. Um, we're also in select UNFI DCs. Um, we are exploring certain regional distributors right now um, that I'm happy to touch on that a little bit later. But otherwise, we've been working with a lot of the newer uh, non-traditional sort of pod direct and pod foods. Um, we do FAIR, which isn't quite a distributor, but obviously a platform for wholesale purchases. We haven't um, leaned in as much to the regional distributor game ourselves, and, um, and I'm happy to talk about that so far but we're we're mostly national with more of a south and west coast spread um so that's kind of our our reach right now love that and Renee of course I should have asked you to give a quick 10 second overview of what Amazi is sure so yeah um Amazi is a tropical fruit snack company on a mission to help you snack on purpose um we make uh tropical fruit snacks in partnership with small businesses and farmers in Uganda so uh socially driven company. And thanks, Michael. And yeah, we were out here trying to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> love it. And they're so good. All right, Jim, I'd love for you just to give a quick intro. Same thing, a little bit about uh, Super Coffee, the product, and then what your distribution profile looks like. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, what's up, guys? I'm Jimmy. I'm the oldest brother and CEO of Super Coffee. I see a few familiar faces out there. Carl Starkey, what's up, man? Chris Wren, good to see you. Um, but no, my brothers and I, we started Super Coffee six years ago out of our, our youngest brother's dorm room in D.C. Uh, we didn't want to drink a bottle of coffee that had 45 grams of sugar and 300 calories. So we, we brewed coffee with protein and, and zero sugar. and We made it taste good. And uh, today we're, we're nationally distributed by Anheuser-Busch. We're in 50,000 stores up and down the street, groceries, convenience. Uh, and it, DSD, for, for those who don't know, is just direct store delivery. So different than what UNFI and KE does. That's more of a broad line. Drop. DSD is more of a full service uh, where they stock the shelves to help build off off shelf displays, um, and and for us we're sort of a, a pure shelf stable beverage play when it comes to go to market. I think that the, one of the risks with DSD is it requires a lot of support. So uh, we're 135 full time employees and we have 80 80 sales reps in the field every day working with Anheuser Busch to to really support those stores. Love that, Jimmy. Appreciate that overview. And then Trent, just a Quick intro on Gotham Brands and your coverage and the work that you do. Sure. So we've got a couple of different platforms. One, we've got our incubator model that we've started with from day one in New York City. So we've got our own distributor, which we tackle about 500 key independents that we use to incubate products in and, and, and move them up. But we've also got a sales support model in multiple cities like Boston, Miami, Houston, Chicago, LA, so that we can support the DSD models. Jim's got his own team, but certain brands don't. We've become a one-stop one shop for that. And then we've got a merchandising team that can cover 
you know, upwards of 3,500 doors on a regular basis. So we can anywhere from a Whole Foods to an HEB to Target, and we can we can target those, and make sure you're on shelf, build displays, etc. So a um, couple different models, but typically all around the brands that we're building. So we put the first case of LaCroix in the market, first case of um, Oatly Frozen, um, first case of Owen. So we've done a lot of first cases um, and built them into a platform where they can grow and be more aggressive in the market. So I love that. So lots of expertise on this call and what we're going to do now is hit on some of these topics from starting out small, growing to regional, um, and then also growing to national and what that entails. So Renee, I'd love for you to first give your perspective on kind of where you started and the first distributors that you started working with. Yeah, and um, we have a bit of a unique model and story, um, so I'm happy to share that. I don't know if I advise it, um, but this is what we did. Uh, so. Um, so we were in conversations with some regional distributors. This is in like 2019, around the time that I had sort of launched our brand. Um, and um, we have, as I mentioned, a unique supply chain, which requires a certain amount of volume to produce an import from overseas. Um, we were in a kind of a tough spot doing a lot of um, small store deliveries, and it just really wasn't making it feasible for us to work our production model. So we actually needed a larger anchor account in order to make our business happen at all. Um, and this was sort of by chance, but I had submitted our items to Sprouts thinking we'd just get a handful of stores and we actually got invited to go um, national with them. Um, and you know, I had a lot of reserves and hesitations because you hear some horror stories about uh, brands doing just that. Um, but we were lucky to kind of have a conversation with them and negotiate a timeline that made sense. Um, and um, that actually opened up our first distribution. So we learned a lot and made a lot of mistakes, which I am more than happy to share um, on this call, of course. But we kind of started with Kehi, um and, and kind of built out from there. And so we kind of learned, okay, Sprouts has opened up five DCs for us initially. They're even growing beyond that now. And how can we build density now out of these DCs in these markets? Um, and that was sort of our approach. It was a bit of a backwards approach, but you know, it, it worked for us from a supply chain perspective and also um, product market fit wise, we thought that Sprouts was a great partner and, and was reaching the right customers and also in the right markets. So that's sort of how we took it. Um, and it was interesting because I, I don't want to take up too much time on this one, but we were in conversation previously with a regional distributor that had very strict exclusivity type um, expectations and we're trying to get us to set our price point with them um, at a certain threshold. And um, as soon as we got this you know, national opportunity, we were like, well, we can't honor both in this sense and, and it didn't it didn't make sense for us at the time to um, pursue that, but that was just something that we had to be careful of when we were in those conversations initially. So, um, and then from there, we did eventually open up UNFI. Um, that was, um, I always say, if you can get an anchor retailer to bring you into a distributor, that is a much easier route than opening up distribution and then trying to, you know, or trying to gather accounts. Um, but that's what we did for UNFI and, and um, in certain select markets that it made sense. So um, we, yeah, that's high level our path. No, I think that's awesome, Renee. And to dive into that a little bit deeper, um, when you're starting out and have to launch an open five DCs, even with an anchor account, it's a lot to manage and a lot of product to ship out and a lot of mistakes that happen. I mean, I would love to hear about some of the learnings that you had when you're trying to roll out across five DCs to start. Sure. Well, um, to be frank, it was a shit show. Uh, <laughs> but we, we, it was a shit show for many reasons because we were changing our production model at the same time. We had to get new UPCs. Um, previously, we had the recycled barcodes. And then when we were going into national distribution with a poor retailer, we were like, oh, that's not going to work. So we had to upgrade all of our UPC codes. Um, we had to, you know, it was, that was a big mess. And we also ended up with a pricing issue um, in that first month where something must have gotten wrong along the way with our paperwork, where we were supposed to be sitting at like around a $4.99 on shelf. And lo and behold, I go to shelf so excited to see the products and they were sitting at $8.99. And I was like, how the heck did that happen? 
I'm certainly not getting that extra money. <laughs> like where, where did we lose that? And we did have to kind of dig deep to find out, you know, at what stage did that mistake happen? And, and we had to reach out to Sprouts and Kehi and kind of do a little bit of digging there. But, um, and I think, you know, we, I was also learning how to use, you know, the reporting on the platform, understand my chargebacks. When is that going to hit? Um, so I would say it was not pretty, uh, <laughs> but it was a good crash course. And um, it's been really, um, I don't know, I feel like it forced me. And again, I wouldn't necessarily recommend everybody take the path that we took, but I will say that I feel like I have a much more hands-on approach with Kehi, with our distributors in general, just because I was very much like in there in the weeds, experiencing all of the mistakes and now knowing like, okay, we have to make sure not to do this. We have to make sure not to do that. Be sure to look out for this, budget for this, know not to do this. So I do feel like um, there was a lot of uh, good things to come of it in the end, so. Yeah. yeah, definitely a trial by fire and having to, to learn as you go. For so, sure. So, <laughs> Jimmy, I know with you guys being at 50,000 stores today, I know it was a, a journey in getting there. And so I'd love for you to talk about what your path went like from selling into your first stores to growing with distribution over time and eventually your partnership with AB InBev and, and what were those steps along the way? I think you're still on mute, Jimmy. Thank you. Um, so I, I think a lot of us face the same challenges when you're first starting out. You know, a distributor won't carry you typically unless you have stores for them to, to bring it to. Stores won't carry you unless you have a distributor. You know, and when you first start, you don't have either of those things. So when we started Super Coffee in 2016, we this was before Amazon owned Whole Foods. We uh, we did a local sell in to one store in Washington D.C. And we decided to make the deliveries to that store. We were a part of the local program. We said, look, we'll, we'll service you guys three days a week, whatever you need. And our, our philosophy back then was inch wide, mile deep. You know, if we only had one store, let's focus all of our resources on that store. You know, and we, we broke that store's weekly sales record in the first four hours. You know, my brothers and I were there every day, stocking shelves, pouring samples. And then once we had a good data story, we took it to the store down the street and we said, hey, we're breaking records at that Whole Foods up the street. Like, give us an opportunity. We'll do the same thing here. And that's really how it went for the first 18 months. You know, we built up our, our distribution route to like 20 to 30 stores in the D.C. area. But we wouldn't move on from one store to the next until we were the best selling coffee in that store. You know, we wanted to, to have a really compelling story. I think a lot of times founders spread themselves too thin and it's really tough to build a story when you're trying to support stores in all different parts of the country. Um, so for us, the, I think the lack of resources was actually a benefit because we couldn't we couldn't go go deep. And at the same time, we also had uh, the discipline to say no to some opportunities. So 2017, our second year of business. Uh, Ralph's Kroger division on the West Coast reached out and said, hey, we want to uh, we want to sell super coffee. We said, sorry, we're, we're based in, on, in the Northeast right now. And that's where we're focused. So we, we turned down a national retailer to, to keep our focus for the first three years. We really grew from D.C. up to Boston. Uh, and then once we had a really good selling story in that one region of the country, we were able to raise money against that and scale regionally from there into HUB in Texas and Publix in the Southeast and Meyer in the Midwest, really going region by region rather than nationally. Uh, and once you, once you build up and, and sort of earn those regional accounts, that's when you have the opportunity to get into local distributors in those markets. So I would say, get the stores first, you know, and, and, and then look for the distributors, ask the stores too. Who do you prefer to work with? Do you, do you like DSD for this market? Do you like UNFI? Do you like to go through your direct warehouse? Uh, and then finally, I think it was a, a good fortune and, and good timing with Anheuser-Busch um, they, they don't own us or anything like that. They're just simply our distributor nationwide. They, with beer sales declining and hard sales, sales, sales declining, they want to grow a non-out business. And, and for us to service Walmart and 7-Eleven and, and CVS nationwide, we needed that national network. Pepsi has Starbucks. Duncan is distributed by Coke. So we couldn't go with those guys. And Anheuser-Busch is a, is a powerful system. So we, uh, we got with them in 2021. Uh, we've been growing the business there for about 18 months now. I love that. And especially when you started out that idea of becoming the best selling product in every store that you launch into, because I can't tell you how many founders I meet. And even I made this my mistake myself when we launched, I was thinking, hey, let's just get our product in the store. It's the retailer's job to sell the product, right? It could be more, more wrong in terms of 
it's still the brand's responsibility to get that product moving off the shelf. And so what were some of the things that you, you did to really get the product moving? Was it like demos every day or promotions? What kind of made the impact? Yeah, and I'm glad you, you, you said it that way because for us, our job starts when our product gets on the shelf. You know, we all know how hard it is to sell into a store, to get in front of a buyer, to get into the next cut in or the, the, the next reset. That's uh, really tough. But what's, what's even tougher than that is getting kicked out of that store at the next reset because you didn't meet the hurdle rates, you know? So I think once you, once you get authorized at a store, that's when your work begins. And if you have the, the means or the resources to, to do demos and sampling events, do it. If you have the opportunity to, to sell in incremental displays, either on the floor with a rack or a shipper or uh, end caps, side caps, whatever, just to get more eyes outside of your home shelf space, do that as well. Um, I think be careful with, with promos, you know, in the early days, like right now we're aiming for a 15% trade spend rate. Um, in the early days, we were 30% trade spend rate. You know, it, it, we got a little bit, uh, addicted to the public's BOGOs. You know, every time we do a buy one, get one free at Publix, we saw our national sales go up. We we're like, dang, this, this feels good. Let's keep doing that. But, uh, you don't want to trade, train your customers to, uh, to buy you guys on, on discount. Uh, and it certainly hurts gross margin as well. So. I think for early brands to shoot for 20 to 25% trade spend is, is the right mix to, to really boost sales. Um, and then don't do things like Facebook ads, driving people into retail. It's, it seems like it makes sense. You know, I could geo target this neighborhood and send people into whole foods. That shit doesn't work. <laughs> don't do that. Um, that if retailers have digital platforms that they want to support, you know, like a, a walmart.com, you know, or target circle, circle promos, things like that definitely participate because if you support the retailers, they tend to support you back. I absolutely love that. I appreciate you going through that. I, we did a uh, panel a couple of weeks ago and talking about that as well. Actually, it was a, um, a podcast with target.com and one of their previous buyers. And he said the same thing. It's like they retailers have a ton of programs and if brands are able to leverage those, they give you great tools and will build great relationships with that buyer. So absolutely love that. Uh, yeah. Trent, Oh, ahead, I was just going to say like one thing that I learned because um, I didn't know that you could ask for this stuff when you first started onboarding. Like I was like, oh, I just have to fill out this promo sheet and submit it to Gay, and that's all we can do. Um, and, you know, I have started to get much better at asking different retailers, like, what do you like to see? What kind of model, you know, works for your store? What programs do you have? We're also certified woman owned or, you know, if there's a certain content piece that they're looking for we always ask about what other programs they have beyond just you know doing a typical promotion on the shelf and sometimes there are some really creative programs out there um and and that you know don't necessarily cost as much but can create a good storytelling opportunity and the buyers really like to see it um so that's another thing that we've we've taken advantage of as well i love that Trent, I want to ask you in terms of, you work with a ton of brands who are launching into distribution for the first time. Were there some of the common mistakes that you see those founders making when they come to you? I think a lot of them just come in and just think that they're done. Um, Jim and I both touched on that. That's when the work really starts because now, um, if, once you go into a distributor, you're gonna wind up, the, the, Distributor could have 200 brands, 300 brands, a couple thousand brands, and now you want to be a part of that, and you're going to be the smallest guy in the block. So um, you might have a lot of competitor brands inside. You might have folks that just simply have relationships with the distributors you're already in with, and how do you penetrate to that? So do you have your promotions lined up? A lot of them don't have promotional dollars once they walk in. They, they've spent their money to get there, and now they don't have another dollar to spend. Um, do they have a sales force? whether it's us or somebody else, your own sales force, are you in your backyard? Are you going to go out and do the work and work with the reps and, and go see the distributors and, and, and really focus on where you want to be? Are you going to start working on their anchor accounts? Do you already have their anchor accounts? It could be a chain. It could be a, you know, a, a neighborhood that they like to work in. And, and how, do you, how do you penetrate that? Can you help them open those doors? Um, there's a lot of work to be done once you get started. And, and a lot of folks aren't ready for that. Do you simply have the simple point of sale ready for them? It could be something as, as simple as, a sell sheet with UPC codes on it so the teams can go out and work with that. Do they have, do they have that available? Um, and then a lot of folks I'm seeing recently and in regards to supply chain, do you have enough product to support them? So if you're opening up a huge distributor versus a smaller distributor, are you, are you willing, willing and able to support them if they open these chains? Do you you got to hold them back a little bit because sometimes, especially recently I've seen 
a lot of out of stocks and out of stocks will kill you because then they're just going to focus on other brands and bigger stores. I'm even seeing swapping and swapping out products after a certain amount of time. COVID, they let them roll for, for a long period of time. They gave grace period, but now in the last three to six months, we're seeing brands just getting swapped out for like products because they're not going to tolerate the out of stocks. They can't, the retailers can't. So you've got to make sure you're prepared and you've got some, some inventory to hold before you open up the next distributor the next distributor you want to be able to support. So I've seen a lot of folks walk in um, thinking that DST is going to do everything and that's not the case. You, you, your, your force has got to be out there selling these retail accounts, placing the orders with distributors, getting their attention, building those relationships, um, creating those promotions with the distributors, whether it's for free, free goods or discounts to make sure that they have the abilities and tools to go out and do it. Incentives always work with, with the distributors, but you can't do those forever. So what happens after you run, you know, the first 30 days in a distributor launch and it's not pulling, do you have a demo team that can go in and start to support some of these in stores? Do you have marketing campaigns, something, you know, as small as, um, trade spend in, in the market to, to make that work. You have billboards on the buses like what we did. So there, there's things on, on many different scales you can go to work and, and the distributors will tell you what's worked with other brands or like items that worked and they, and they like to work with, um, but you got to follow their lead, right? So a lot of that is the pre-work when you go in, um, sitting with the distributor and not just trying to just sell in, just to sell in. It might not even be the right fit, but once you do realize you have the right fit, most distributor managers will tell you, I need X, Y, and Z to make this work. And if you can do X, Y, and Z, you've got a good shot. Trent, when you think about brands who have worked with you and your team to build a good relationship, what are the things that they're doing? How often are they kind of meeting with you and the team? Are they doing anything to incentivize you guys? Like, what are those things that stand out for the founders who are doing the best and building those relationships with you? I think that they're involved, right? We've got brands that might be overseas and they're not involved at all. Um, that's one, one, one way it could be. They could be on a different coast and they just want to open up New York. But certainly just being involved with the team, whether it be, and you could be on a different coast, but just, just having you know, a monthly meeting with the team to get their feedback. Because a lot of times, I, I, we do this a lot. So we'll have a launch meeting just so my, the teams can get used to what to sell and how to sell it and what the brand's about, right? That all goes out the window the second you go the first account. They have no idea what it said. And all of a sudden they start hitting a lot of walls. Um, Maybe it's a competitor issue, maybe it's a pricing issue, maybe you know it's, it's they're trying to sell in the wrong wrong spot in the store to wrong buyers. Having that follow meeting two weeks after launch is I think pretty important because we've seen a lot of a lot of feedback and questions and because where where the guys have hit walls or had success, you can share that pretty quickly um, and get some support, right? So if we need if maybe the promo isn't working and we did a five one to get get into stores originally. We need a four and one or a three and one to make that happen. Rather than go months or, or, or weeks, you could you can nip that in the bud in the cup, first couple first ten days and make that happen. So, um, also what's a because, good yeah, what's a good communication it. cadence? Because I know some founders are like don't want to be too annoying and like reaching out to you all the time, <laughs> but they also don't want think you know months to go by without knowing anything. Is it like once a month check ins or every two weeks or? So I, I think it, it, as much as you can, and the distributors will tell you, right? They'll, they'll tell you, hey, look, we have monthly meetings where we want to meet with you once a quarter. You can come in here and work with our guys once a week. And each distributor is a little different. So I think whatever they're going to give you, you take. So, you know, if they're, they're telling you if, they can, if you can work with somebody once a week or if you can meet somebody once a month, make sure you take advantage of that. Don't don't just bypass it. Because to your point, if, you, if they tell you once a month and you start calling the guy every single morning, these guys are busy. That's one thing as a distributor, any distributor it is, from loading trucks to refusals to collecting money, these guys have a lot on their plate. So, and a lot of brands. So if you're calling and 20 other brands are calling every morning, it would be pretty annoying. It sounds like ask and then follow their lead. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Love that. And, and you can push the envelope a little bit, but you know, you gotta, you gotta yeah. follow, yeah. So, so Jimmy, we actually got a question that Matt asked. He said, for beverage, do you use different distributors by channel? And does it make sense to use DSD as much as possible, or is there a good mix between DSD versus UNFI and KPs of the world? Good question, man. So um, the way DSD is split up is it's very territorial and very geographic. And, and Renee will tell you, or uh, Trent and, and Renee will both tell you this, is if you're a distributor and you're servicing stores in New York City, you don't want another distributor serving servicing the same stores that you do, right? So uh, for, for us, if you have a distributor for New York City, that's your only distributor in New York City. And, and they have exclusive rights to all channels, all trade from food service all the way down to, to grocery, bodegas, mass club, you name it. 
Um, and sorry, what was the, the second part of, of the question? Yeah, in terms of what's what mix between DSD and then working with like a UNFI or Kahi? Yeah, so for us, we're probably 70% DSD. There are some customers that prefer a UNFI or a Kahi. You know, like Sprouts, we service with Kahi. Whole Foods in some territories, we service with UNFI. I'm pretty sure we're still UNFI at Wegmans up in the Northeast. Uh, and that, those are tough conversations that you have to be forthright with your distributors on. You know, I, I know in New York with Big Geyser, Jerry Rita is some days my best friend and some days my worst enemy because he wants to service every account in, in uh, New York City, right? And uh, if there's a, a new Wegmans store that opens and Wegmans is going through UNFI, Jerry's going to throw a fit because that's a violation of his contract, you know? So I think for, for me, what we've learned is like, rather than trying to sneak stuff by, the distributors always find out, just be open and forthright. And if their incentives and just are aligned, uh, then if the distributor or if the, if the retailer only wants to carry your product through UNFI or Kahi, most of the time, the DSD distributors in that territory will understand that. So Jim, for those who don't fully understand, can you talk about the difference between DSD and a typical distributor? Um, yeah, so I say UNFI and Kahi are probably typical distributors, like they're broadliners, right? And uh, your product, let's say you get planogrammed at a Whole Foods region, that's going to get set up at the local Whole Foods, it's at the local UNFI warehouse. And from there, uh, it's basically the store orders it as they get, as you get down to a certain number of units left on the shelf or in back stock, uh, the store will re-trigger that order through UNFI. UNFI drops that order off at the loading dock and it's the store's responsibility to stock the shelves versus DSD. The best DSD system I could think of is Coca-Cola, right? You, we've all seen the big red trucks. We all see aisles in the grocery store filled with Coke products, everything from vitamin water, smart water, body armor now to Coca-Cola and Diet Coke. Uh, it's a full aisle. That Coke rep is in the store writing the order for what that store needs. Uh, and the stores love it because it provides service. You know, Coke services most stores three to five times a week. And the, the it's good for the brand because that Coke rep is going to it. At the same time, he's not going to sell in or she's not going to sell in more product than that store needs because that burns a relationship with that retailer. So uh, I think DSD gives you that flexibility to be aggressive, to take space. You know, Trent said it, if, if a competitor is out of stock, that store, you can't sell air, you know, so, so that store is going to turn to the next competitor that has product in the warehouse just to get bottles on the shelf. So DSD allows for that, whereas I think a UNFI or a Keggy kind of stays to the planogram and, and really limits your opportunity to go, to go off shelf. Yeah, if you have a DSD in the store, right, they might be able to see that the shelf is empty for the competitive space and then talk to the buyer and say, hey, you need some extra product, we can fill in it for you. Yeah, and, and an aggressive DSD or, or a you super coffee it. sales rep will say, well, not, they won't just do it, they won't, won't burn a relationship, but they might make some space and say, hey, that, that, those chips are running low over there, what if, we, what if we put some super coffee on that shelf? Yeah, <laughs> love that. Um, I know, you know, DSD has been mostly prevalent for like beverage, probably because it's been led by, by Coke and some of the others. Um, I'd be curious, Renee, are you using any DSD um, distributors? We're not. Um, and we are in conversation with some because we have done some initiatives in stores for secondary placement, like clip strips, for example. We have branded clip strips that work in produce really well for us, for example. Um, and We've tried to go through, you know, third-party merchandising services in the meantime, which, you know, definitely helps, but it's certainly a big expense and not something for us that we could do super long-term. Um, and plus it was also tough where we did have instances where if it's not the streamlined, you know, DSD model where they also have product, you know, it's like, okay, well, for whatever reason, the fill rates are low and I'm here at the store and I have a clip strips to set up, but there's no back stock and I can't be the one who fill it. I have to ping this person to like order through them. And then, so it does create, I wouldn't say it's a perfect solution to use a third party merchandising service. Then again, you know, just like we were saying before, nothing is a perfect solution. You have to, you know, be ready to stay on top of things and, and kind of problem solve out there, no matter who your partner is. Um, that's, just the name of the game you can't just expect them to be a silver bullet no matter what solution you choose but um i guess long answer short we haven't utilized a full service dsd to this point yeah you know when i was launching when i launched my brand t squares 
we didn't use the DSC. We had some regional distributors, national. And for instance, like with Whole Foods, similar to Jimmy, we started off like I was driving the store, stocking the shelves myself with product and it was you know fine, but it wasn't scalable. And then we brought in a regional distributor, a good relationship with Whole Foods, and they actually made sure our product was, was in stock on the shelf and the Whole Foods team does a really good job at that. But when we launched into a more, up, more conventional um, retailer, we had the product drop off at the back door and I would go in the store and I could not find the product because it was ended up being merchandised in five different places across the store. And because we didn't have a DSD actually going in and stocking and making sure the product ended up in the right place, like literally I went in the store, looked around for 20 minutes before I could even find our product. And that was a really um, eye-opening <laughs> that revealed to me in terms of the value of DSD relationships or um, having good merchandisers when you're working with accounts that don't do it themselves. And a lot of them don't. So Renee, another question that came in that maybe you can answer as well. Um, in terms of building a retail financial model for a new brand, they said they're currently not in retail. What percentage should be planned for demo and support costs? Yeah, so, I mean, we have our dedicated trade spend and then we have separate marketing budgets. Um, you know, I aim and it doesn't, I analyze this quarterly, but I aim to be somewhere between 15 and 20% um, for each of them. Um, I think it, also depends on the main retailers that you're partnering with kind of what I was getting at a little bit before like for example Sprouts you know they're an account that's going to want a pretty competitive EDLP um, so budgeting for that as opposed to budgeting for demos there is far more effective and the cost implications of each of those is different and if I know that that's going to be an account that I'm really leaning into and focusing on I'll kind of build around that but I would say just percentage wise, I've budgeted in the 15 to 20% range um, for those activities. Um, and yeah, I think if you have a stronger field marketing presence, you know, you might have to start a little bit steeper than that. Um, it sounds like Jim started steeper than that in the early days, um, but that's how I've approached it so far. Yep. And just to reiterate, if you missed it, Jimmy said they started off at about 30%, which is really high, and their goal is to get it down to, to 15%, which they're working towards now. Um, you know, it's interesting. One thing that I started looking at as I was helping brands look at their e-commerce and the cost of customer acquisition and thinking about how that applies in a similar way to retail, because when you're in the retail store, you still need a first-time customer to try the product and then hopefully like rebuy. And it's interesting because a lot of people are fine losing money on the first purchase for D to C sales uh, and then making it up with like a second or third purchase, but aren't really thinking that same way as it turns to retail. Uh, Jimmy or Renee, have either of you started thinking about that like trial promotion for new customers and, and incentives you can do to get trial with the hopes that they'll become a repeat buyer? Yeah, I think it, it starts with the good product, right? You got to believe in your product. And, and that's one thing that, that we learned along the way. Our, our, our coffee started out pretty niche. You know, we have MCT oil and it's sweetened with monk fruit, you know, but we're competing with the Starbucks Frappuccino. That's just coffee with milk and sugar. So over the years, we've evolved our message to be more of this sort of whole foods natural play, to be more of a mainstream play anchored around flavor. Uh, I think if, if you guys are in the space of, of creating healthy foods, you have to remember it has to taste good first. You know, people will not sacrifice mainstream America. That is think about the Walmart shopper rather than the whole food shopper will not sacrifice taste for health. If it doesn't taste good, they might try it once, but they will not buy it again. So I think flavor is, is the most critical piece to that retention. Uh, and then it's all about, we, we call it sips to lips. Once you have a product that, that tastes good, good enough for people to convert from their, their favorite brand to uh, then you do the sampling, then you show up at the events, you know, you might team up with an Ibotta or a Catalina a shop for marketing platform to, to run coupons or, or promotions on the back of receipts in stores. Um, but it really starts with good flavor. And, and I mean, for six years, we've been evolving and developing and iterating on our flavor every, every six months, really. And Jamie, you guys just actually relaunched one of your most popular, well, the flavor that I, I think is like you or some of the team members love the most and you just relaunched it, right? Can you tell that yeah, story? Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, we, when we first started out, we, uh, we had a vanilla coffee, a mocha coffee, 
and a cinnamon flavored coffee. You know, we, we like putting cinnamon in our coffee. It had health benefits, good antioxidants. And the, the packaging was sort of reddish, uh, like the color red. It almost looked like big red gum. It was delicious. It tasted like cinnamon toast crunch, but because it wasn't a popular flavor that people were familiar with, it didn't sell very well. It was certainly our best tasting item, didn't sell very well. So we, we retired that flavor. And just now, I mean, it was basically off the shelf for five years. Just two months ago, we, we brought it back. And instead of calling it cinnamon coffee or cinnamon latte, we're calling it cinnamon roll. And the, the package on the front of the coffee is like a big cinnamon bun. Uh, it looks super indulgent. It actually tastes like a cinnamon bun now, sugar-free. Uh, and it quickly became our best-selling SKU. So honestly, the same product, the same liquid that was in that bottle five years ago, different position, different packaging. Uh, sort of playing to that indulgent flavor rather than some functional, healthy niche product. And I may have a follow-up question on that. As you evolved from natural channel to conventional mainstream messaging, did your pricing change as well? Yeah, the pricing is the toughest thing. And, and Carl texted me on the side here. So um, let's spend a second on this. Uh, pricing is, is critical to get right because in the DSD model, you're selling to distributors cheaper than what you are to, to UNFI or KE because there's a level of service that they're providing that you wouldn't get elsewhere. So uh, your cost to them is, is cheaper. So that's less money that you're making. Uh, and as a new item, you're going to have to promo too. You know, So like, let's say you're on a 30% trade spend the way that we were in the early days. Our gross margin after we sold to the distributor was 25%. So after we promoted, we had a negative gross margin. Trade spend comes out of margin. You know, and, and in the early days, sure, you can price a coffee four bucks, five bucks at Whole Foods and, and the Whole Foods crowd will buy it, but nobody's ever bought a $5 coffee at Walmart. You know, it just doesn't exist. So uh, the Seth Goldman from Honest Tea calls it field of dreams pricing. And the idea, this isn't a strategy, but it's a, it's a good concept, is that if you price your product in line with competitors, you're going to sell more of that product. And as you scale, your cost to make that product will come down. Now, in an inflationary time where supply chains all jacked up as it is right now, I mean, we're selling millions of more units today than we were five years ago, yet all of our costs are more expensive than they were five years ago. And there's, there's only a limited elasticity, like an, a limited threshold to the extent you can pass those costs through to consumers. So honestly, the bigger we're getting, the tighter our margin's been getting over the last couple of months. So I, I'll, I'll tell you guys, pricing is, is critical. I think set your, set your shelf price up for a, a position where you can have that 40% margin in beverage is, is the magic number. That's, that's the gross margin that you have to aim for in beverage. Um, we're not there yet. You know, we're hundred million dollars in sales. We're, we're a 30% gross margin this year. You know, so we still have a, a, a long way to go to get to that 40% number. Um, and then, so that's the shelf price should get you to 40, maybe even 50% and then set up your, your promo plan where you're, you're in the 20s to 30s for the first few years. Uh, and then you can slowly dial back those promos and tinker with uh, tinker with it. The other thing too, I mean, every big company, Anheuser-Busch, Coke, Pepsi, they take a 2% price increase every single year, no matter what. So, uh, I mean, we just took our first price increase this year. We missed an opportunity to take that 2% increase every year for the last five. So don't be afraid to raise prices. Uh, everybody, everybody does it. Yeah, and that makes sense, right? You end up and you see a lot of brands who are in situations where their price is the same, everything is going up in comparison, and they're suffering. I actually just talked to two businesses that went out of business because they didn't think they could raise their pricing and ingredients were up. So they decided to, to shut down, which is unfortunate. Um, but there's definitely those inflationary pressures that are that are going on now. Um, so Michelle had a question. What are some of the successful regions that have surprised you? Renee, if you have any as well that you're selling in. Um, yeah, I mean, and also just to add one thing to the previous yeah. comments, like this isn't necessarily within retail per se, but we've gotten really creative about other revenue streams um, and what other channels can we sell through to also supplement retail because retail is so expensive and we try to think of it as overall contribution margin between the various channels that we sell through um you know we sell into some airports we sell direct into some offices we you know have started to do we do a lot of you know imperfect foods for example 
and and that's pretty clean business. Um, it's pretty straightforward, not like all the backwards math of okay, it's delivered here, and then I'm gonna get charged back for this and this and this, and where am I actually at? So I do try to supplement my margin in that way as well. So just a comment there. Um, but regional, um, yeah, I think I thought initially SOPAC and like the West Coast was gonna be super hot for us. And, you know, I think in the beginning it kind of was because it's a very forward region, um, but we've actually found a lot more success in the Southeast and Texas. Um, like Florida has been great for us, uh, Texas, Georgia, so I don't know if it's just the warmer weather and the tropical snacks and, and you know, people, I think we've also learned that our, our customer, we've learned a lot about our customer through the process as well. And I think in the beginning, I thought it was someone super niche who was going to look for that cool story. And, and it's actually just mostly women, moms who want a healthier, tasty thing that they can maybe share with their kids. And then it's, it's fun and it's different than other products in our set. And so um, I think we're a little bit more, general than I thought we were. Um, and that's kind of led to different regions as well. Um, yeah. Did you ever fight that Renee? To say like, no, 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 we should really be going after this niche customer. I had that experience where it was so hard um, to think like, you know, like with T-squares, we had an energy component in the taste, but like half of our customers were like, I don't know if you actually get energy from this, but I love the crunch and the taste. And like, that was just, it was interesting to hear, but it was kind of hard to hear as the founder too. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to be willing to let go of like, I remember the first, first, first days of me demoing, I would spend so much time talking about our mission. And then I was like, and then they'd be like, no, thanks. And I'd be like, how can you not want to try this? We're doing all this good stuff. What is wrong with you? And I would take it really personally that they didn't care. And I'm like, you, you act like you're such a conscious shopper and you're not. <laughs> and, you know, like now actually our messaging, you know, we definitely remind people of our mission. It's on the bag somewhere, but it's, we've learned how to kind of, uh, you know, shift with, with who likes it. Um, you know, most of our customers are not who I thought they were going to be. And that's great. Uh, we try to just be more available to that. And I think it's important to listen to your customer. Um, so yeah. I love that. So last uh, big question, everyone, and then we're going to hop over to open questions. So if you have a question, think of that right now. We'll um, open up to raise your hand. But maybe we'll start with with Trent. And one of the I know you guys do things a little bit differently, but one of the biggest um, headaches for brands launching distribution or dealing with chargebacks and fees for this and that, uh, especially with the national distributors, um, do you know like why those tend to exist and what your perspective is on, on chargebacks and, and lots of additional fees? Um, a lot of it comes from really the suppliers up front in, in not necessarily the distributors run the same programs over and over again. And up front, you might ask for a lot of things and not, not anticipate what it's actually going to cost you. So you might think you're running a simple 5% off, 10% off, 20% off, and then you don't realize the volume potential of that taking off or, Jim mentioned earlier with running a BOGO in public, you know, that, that's going to cost you significant dollars over and over again. And then they don't realize that there's a buy-in period, that there's a sales period afterwards, um, and you're responsible for that. So you might not anticipate seeing large numbers as you grow, but I, I see a lot of it. Um, distributors do what they do. Unify always has that black hole where you, you don't really understand the math in the back end, but you certainly know what you're getting into when you're going forward. So um, it's looking at it three months out and saying, here's what we sold in, here's what we got back, and here's my real margin is really what it comes down to. And here's the programs we ran, here's did it work or did it not work. But it's always looking backwards um, to see what worked and, and seeing financially if it made sense and did you get any growth off of that. And that could be running from a, running a demo, running a promotion, um, running some marketing campaigns with the stores. You know, you, you want to take a look and see if you had that lift afterwards, um, whether it's after a sale. You know, did you get that lift? Because you can't live on a sale forever. So um, you want you always want to make sure you're you're doing your number crunch afterwards to make sure it makes sense. Jim, what's what's been your uh, experiences with promos with uh, distributor chargebacks? Um, so there's certain things that are agreed upon, uh, right, with the with the retailers, uh, and then there's EDLPs that get the distributors hold to their margin. I don't like EDLPs because it doesn't help us sell product. You know, if, if a distributor needs to get to their margin, they like ideally if they're 
they're incentivized to help you build your brand. They would split those costs with you. Um, I think the, the tricky thing, and, and it's, this is tough for a lot of young companies, we still don't have this, is disputing billbacks. You know, and, and I, I don't want to say anything bad about KE or, any, or UNFI. Let's, let's talk about CNS up in, uh, up in New England. They, they service <laughs> Stop and Shop and, and Giant. They, uh, they, they're notorious for having these sort of vague, ambiguous billbacks mm-hmm. that weren't agreed upon. There's, there's, they're for, I don't know, expired product or abused product or dented product. And, and if you're not disputing that, it could literally be hundreds of thousands of dollars of deductions. It's not only cash out of your revenue, it also yep. hurts your gross margin. So uh, I would definitely look to, to put a process in place to, to really dispute any billbacks that weren't agreed upon in writing ahead of time. And to Jim's point, just as he disputes it, once a distributor knows you're going to dispute it and look at it, they're going to be a little bit more diligent when they give you the next paperwork as opposed to six other brands that don't even look at it and they're just going to send them out and and not and, and get paid for it, right? So if if you catch things and, and they'll they'll give you reasons and and if those reasons are valid, maybe you want to just start to pull them back and there's there's ways to pull them back after you see it. But you, you do want to you want to have those conversations. Yeah, definitely. For Maybe. sure. And and Trent, Trent, to that point, man, like it's distributors have the same list. They're like, they know if you don't dispute things and they take their liberties with the brands that, that don't don't ever push back on, on billbacks. No, I've got brand, I'll, I've got brands in our distributor, you know, if we want to offer a free fill, they, they don't care. Right. And I've got other brands that have limited number of cases they want to give away per month. And, and we try to adhere to that very close. And if we have to go over it, then we make that call to to the brand to make sure it's OK. So. Um, it's also setting it up front to make sure here's here's our cost and here's what we're available here's what we're, we can avail this month and you know let, let's run with it that so to have, have, a, have that relationship with the distributor help so and I think also just um, two things on that one is we literally run at least once a week checks of our um, chargebacks and we dispute anything that we don't fully understand what it is you know even if you're not sure you think it might be something we dispute anything that we're not sure and ask for backup. And, you know, the systems are sometimes designed to make it hard and annoying for you so that you don't do it. Um, And so we keep track internally of, okay, when's the last time we heard back about this? Is there another person that we can loop in? And we kind of are that squeaky wheel. And I can't say everyone loves it, but it gets us answers. Um, And and the other thing too, I was going to say, just re the free fill. We actually negotiated some of our contracts early on. And if you are a young brand onboarding, with certain programs with distributors, sometimes it's already waived, but you know, template contracts with distributors will sometimes just allow any free fill ever. Like somebody can just grab a free fill and, and we had that removed from our contract early on because we were like, that's just not gonna work. Um, and so we, you know, we agree to other things, but, but you don't have to agree to everything. Um, and um, yeah, I would, you know, Distributors don't necessarily love that, but you have to do what's going to keep you in business. And if it's not, if it's going to put you out of business, it's probably not a good decision. So, um, yeah. And some, some, dis- some distributors will work with you, right? Ne- you can negotiate with them. So if you've got a regular ongoing one and five, some some dist- distributors will split that case with you. So asking up front, you know, you, you can go a long way just by asking. From personal experience, I have found that generally a lot of the regional distributors will have marketing programs that you participate in that they'll charge back for, but it's easier to understand a little bit more up front. Some of the national distributors are, there's a lot of things that they're doing, lots of marketing programs, lots of um, products that they have to worry about. So there's just more fees that they potentially could charge. And so you definitely have to watch out and understand up front what all of those are. Some distributors have a fee for opening new stores. They'll definitely have fees for opening new DCs. And it might be per SKU or it might be per brand. So as much as you can, talk to other founders and try to understand what those components are so you can be aware of it, right? There's some instances where um, distributors are erroneously sending chargebacks and you dispute them and they're not the case. A lot of them, there are things that you agree to that you didn't realize you agreed to. Here's just as a quick story, when we were selling um, with one of our, through Kehi with Jewel, um, we sold a product through Jewel, our contact there left, they ended up overbuying product and the product expired and they returned all that product for a full refund. And when we looked at it at the end of the day, about 30% of all the product we sold to them was refunded, that was charged back that we had to pay. 
So it was what we agreed to, but it was absolutely detrimental to our business because they were overbuying and we couldn't get in touch to actually make sure it sold through at the store or they had the right inventory levels. And so as Renee mentioned, you have to be looking at this either yourself or your accountant, or um, there's a couple of softwares out there like PromoMash to manage um, your, your trade spend so that you know exactly where your money's going and if it's legitimate or not. So I also wanna check out, I think we have a couple other questions in the chat here. Tyler asked, wondering how we can go about pitching, distributing and food service and private label chan channels as a smaller brand. Um, I'm happy to touch on that. We've yeah. started to do that more this year. Um, I would say it definitely depends on your model and your bandwidth. I think it's great for padding your cash flow. I think it's great for reducing production costs for sure, but also, think about energy in the day and um, it's a completely other world. And I think in terms of volume too, especially private label, you're gonna be needing to do a decent amount of volume and you're also, it's a longer term contract. It probably will take a long time to start up. You know, For example, we are in some private label conversations right now, which probably won't go live for 12 to 15 months. And um, you know, once that gets started, you have to be really ready to produce those volumes because it's under those labels. And you're also probably going to be carrying their inventory on hand. So it's definitely an investment. I think food service, depending how you approach it, is fantastic. Um, you know, if you are able to navigate it in a scrappier way, um, you know, it's easy. But then once you get to a certain volume as well there, you know, there's, you know, you might need to get into Vistar or something like that to, to service certain accounts. So I mean, for us, it's been great because we also have our own production. As I mentioned, we have a very unique supply chain, which is why we've taken the model that we've taken. But um, we basically own a portion of our, our production facility. So it's basically in-house, but also co-packing because we're not the ones handling it. And they need, they have a lot of extra capacity. So we may as well tap into that, um, make our partners and farmers happy give them more business, produce, for example, dried pineapple for people who want to buy it in bulk. That's what we've started to do this year. I don't brand it, but I sell it. Um, and, and it's great for cash flow and again, production, you know, cogs lower. But I think you really have to consider, um, again, your bandwidth to open up those channels, to serve those channels, because even if the margins might be better, um, it's still labor and work and, and time to figure out. So that's what I would say. One thing I'll add about food service, and Tyler, happy to talk more offline, but most food service distributors don't want most new products. And so you really need a, a retail or like a, an office or a university that's going to pull, be pulling you in for them to take you on. Um, they like very traditional products still. It's a little bit of older market. And then Mark had a question. For those of you selling both online and in retail, how much are your pricing decisions influenced by distributor input versus your own analysis like when you're setting pricing with distributors? Um, so the you, you, people who buy online, especially in bulk, for us, we, we pretty much only sell single bottles in stores. They they expect a bulk discount, right? So your your case, like let's say Super Cup is $3 a bottle in stores, so that'd be $36 online we would sell for $33 online to give that consumer that, that bulk discount. Um, and so long as you're offering unique packs online, and I mean, you'll never, it would be very rare if a distributor could buy your product online cheaper than what you sell it to them for, you know? So I don't think that's, I don't think that's an issue. Um, but I think as, so long as you're, you're offering your online customers something that they can't get from your distributors, in our case, a full 12 pack, um, then you should be you should be pretty protected. Uh, one thing that you guys should all look into is called MAP pricing. I think it stands for minimum something price. Uh, but basically, if you're selling on online or on Amazon, if you have MAP pricing, no other online marketplaces can sell cheaper than your established MAP price. Right? What you don't want is a Walmart.com or an Alibaba or so and so popping up undermining your prices. So uh, really establish that MAP price as you get into other marketplaces. And I actually saw something from a brand where they'll actually make new distributors or new retailers sign that map pricing um, to make sure that they're not getting undercut. Because a lot of times, right, if you're doing sale, retailers or distributors are doing sales, and a lot of times that product's showing up on Amazon for discount and causing issues with brands that way as well. Perfect. Um, any final tips 
about working with distributors that you wish you had known when you were starting out, Jimmy? Any, any things that we wish we knew before we launched? Yeah, anything that you, things you know now that you wish you knew at the beginning when you were starting out with distributors? Yeah, uh, Trent, close your ears for this one. We learned the hard way, at least our experience with Super Coffee is distributors don't build brands. You know, they, they have a, a warehouse full of products. They do a good job keeping keeping stores and shelves, but they're not going to sell your product the same way that you do. And I, I think that that is a tough lesson to swallow because you want distributors to, to sell for you. You want retailers to stock shelves for you. The, the reality is like this brand is going to grow as big and as fast as, as you are behind it. To, to Trent's point, like the brands that he supports the most are the ones that are in there the most often, right? And uh, I, I, I don't want to make Trent's life harder right now, but if a distributor is only willing to meet with you once a week, be there twice a week, you know, be there, be as aggressive. Obviously don't piss somebody off. Uh, don't be annoying. We've, we've done that. We've gone too far in, in stores sometimes and, and uh, almost at the risk of getting kicked out. Uh, but it's a lot of freaking work, guys. Like the, nobody's going to stock your shelves. Uh, if there's an empty shelf out there, don't expect your distributor, don't expect your retailer to do it. Uh, and, and I think that for us, that's been that's that was the secret in the early years. And then you build up a rapport with the distributors that this brand cares, this brand is going to work hard. Uh, and then you build that two way street. But that it's earned, you know, like a distributor is not going to launch and build your product as fast as you want it to go. No. And Jim hit it right on. I mean, that's why we work with 10 brands and under so that we can focus on them, because there's just no way you see some of these guys that have 60 brands, 200 brands, 2000 brands. There's just no way a distributor can spend that much time. You imagine seeing a buyer and you're on page seven of, you know, of a 200 page uh, catalog and, you know, the guy's walking away from you. So that's why we, we limit the brands that we focus on. Don't take on competing brands so that we can continue to focus and push the other brands out of the way that makes sense. But he's spot on, you know, you want to, you want to get that focus. You want to get that attention. The only way to do that is by, by minimizing and focusing. So that's, that's where our guys are good at it. So. Awesome. I appreciate that too, Trent. Renee, any final thoughts? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think along those lines, like I'm very squeaky wheel about, about things, not to the point that it's annoying, but you know, again, dealing with some of these bigger distributors like KHE, like UNFI, and sometimes, you know, certain systems aren't built out to make it easy for you to find the information that you need. And, and we, we stay on top of it. And, and, you know, we ask our um, SRM or our CM, and if they don't know, we try to find the account manager, we try to find somebody else, we do a lot of detective work to figure out who can help us get the answers that we need. Because, you know, otherwise, no one's gonna get that for you. And, um, and I think that, you know, um, it, it does take at least a preparedness, in, in my experience, to, to kind of not expect things to go smoothly and, and be ready to kind of dig in there and, and figure it out. And, um, and I think that as long as you come at it from an angle of like, Hey guys, like I'm really trying to make this partnership successful. Like I'm, you know, we can't sell more if product isn't getting to the shelf. Like we can't open up this new opportunity that we have in the pipeline. If this product is sitting in the warehouse or if the fill rates aren't where they need to be, like we just can't sustain it. And we have this, you know, we want to keep working together. So it, it is about partnership and, and, you know, also again, doing your homework and not just being like, Hey guys, this is wrong. Like, you know, doing your homework, trying to see where the data leads, trying to see um, what's going on on your own so that you can present what you found and see who can help you from there, as opposed to kind of, you know, being like, this is wrong. And they'll be like, well, reach out to this team. And it's like, that could be a dead end. So um, there, there is, I, I do try to do my very best um, in handling challenges. And, and I also think it's important to, as best you can, not only ping them when things are going wrong, like also, you know, let them know when things are going well or, or be excited to meet them if they're at a trade show or something like that. You know, it's not just, you know, reporting on when things are bad either. So uh, nice it's a relationship. All the good news. I love that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's a great note to end on. Renee, Jimmy, Trent, thanks so much for joining the day. Thanks so much to everyone. As I mentioned, we'll have the conversation recorded and sent out on Monday. So best of luck, everyone. Have a great weekend.